Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for being here, and a big thank you to the National Bank for having this project uh, on the program. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Alberto, who is also here, uh, who is uh, doing his PhD currently with me, and is also at the National Bank of Belgium. So the starting point of this paper is kind of a little bit at odds with what Paul was saying, but uh, there's some signs of globalization slowing down. It might be Maybe we're not in deglobalization, but there might be globalization. We're not on the trend of integration uh, that we have been since the 1970s. And so there's many ways to, to measure this, but a very simple statistic, like trade over GDP for the world, um, which has been around 25% in the early 1970s, rose to 60% around up to the financial crisis. And then afterwards, things have been stalling. And there have been several reasons for this. Uh, one is, uh, for instance, natural supply chain disruptions, such as the recent COVID-19, effectively shutting down production and consumption in large parts of the world. Over geopolitical tensions, such as the US-China trade wars under Trump, and unfortunately also a series of arms conflicts and outright wars right now. And so these, both natural, geopolitical, and uh, 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 armed conflict events have shown that even if we're not directly exposed to these things happening in different parts of the world, we tend to be affected, and perhaps we are actually very vulnerable to what these things are uh, doing to us, uh, directly or indirectly, uh, uh, in the world. And so, even if this globalization has been stalling or not, that may be up for debate, but at least the perception is like that for policymakers, and policymakers have been implementing several series of measures to try to reduce dependence on third countries, so, uh, von der Leyen has been talking about decoupling and de-risking for a long time for global value chains, uh, and try to incentivize firms to produce at home. Um, and again, there's many ways to measure this, but like the Global Trade Alert uh, database is a nice uh, uh, inventory uh, where they're looking at the rise or the yearly new measures that have been implemented um, since 2009 in this case, uh, that might be either liberalizing or protectionist, and by far, the, so first of all, this has been stable until 2017, 19, and this has been increasing a lot since then. Uh, and second, most of those measures are by far harmful or protectionist in nature. And there's a bunch of examples uh, for this, not only the US, so in the US you have the Inflation Reduction Act, which has been about many things, but not per se, per se about inflation reduction. Um, you have the EU, uh, it's open strategic autonomy paradigm since 2013. How can we be open to trade but still be strategic in how we are going to think about our trade relationships? Um, more recently, there's the EU CHIPS Act and the ongoing Green Deal and Blue Deal. And even within Europe, there has been this nascent resurgence uh, in terms of reviving industrial policy, spearheaded mostly by countries such as uh, France and Germany. And also some concerns in terms of uh, security reasons actually also in Belgium triggering one of the articles of the EU to bypass uh, public procurement uh, reasons. In the context of this paper, we're going to talk about regional inequalities. So um, it's also interesting to see that not only countries are having these kind of initiatives, but also at the regional level this is happening. So a great example here is the European Semiconductor Regions Alliance, which has been signed in May 2023. Um, which is covering 27 uh, regions across the EU, across uh, 12 EU member states. And so they're not necessarily connected, right? So think of ASML in parts of the Netherlands, but also parts of the production of those chips, for instance, in Spain or France or Germany. And so the question we're after in this paper is to try to understand what's the impact of those, let's call them uh, bluntly protectionist measures, on, on EU welfare. And so the guiding literature up till now has been thinking about several types of policy instruments that policymakers have at their disposal to incentivize this domestic production. And so we can think about trade policy, if we're going to increase tariffs with the rest of the world, to make those goods much more expensive, we might shift away towards domestic uh, consumption of those goods. Industrial policy, if we're going to subsidize parts of production, this makes it cheaper to produce goods at home, so this might be triggering domestic production as well. Um, public policy is roughly covering um, anything that's related to infrastructure work, so we can think about building roads and bridges, but also high-speed internet that's uh, going to generate public uh, spillovers to, to the rest of the economy. And so it's clear that any type of policy might have direct and indirect effects on both the EU and all of its regions, 
But depending on the type of policy, this might have very different effects, right? So think of this morning, it was the example of electric vehicles, but let's say there's a tariff in the EU from steel from China, and how is it going to affect Byron, which has a very strong uh, car manufacturing industry, which is used as an input in their car manufacturing, versus Andalusia, which probably has not such a big uh, car manufacturing sector. And so, first order, we can think that, of course, Byron is going to be directly affected because they are importing a lot of this stuff, perhaps, from China. In the other uh, regions, perhaps not. But indirectly, because of those value chains and uh, other general equilibrium effects, there might be spillovers to other EU sector regions. But if you're a policymaker, what, should, what type of policy should we implement? We don't even know how those regions are exposed. We don't know how they are connected to how, how they might be affected by particular types of policies. And so one of those reasons is that this regional information on what, about production and consumption uh, linkages and input-output linkages is very scarce. Uh, and if you don't have that information, how can we think about simulating a potential policy, what will be the impact on the EU uh, and also on its regions, if you don't know the, the, this regional structure? So in this paper, we would try to evaluate the toolbox of these protectionist policies, again, going to trade, industrial, and public policy. Um, and we're going to have two layers of decision-making. There will be local governments um, that will going to be setting industrial and public policy, and there will be a supranational uh, government that's going to decide on trade policy, right? So we're really thinking about the EU as a guiding example in this case. We're going to develop a quantitative uh, general equilibrium framework to evaluate those policies. There will be multiple sectors, because we have I.O. linkages. There will be multiple regions, because we care about the regions in this case. Um, and all those sectors and regions will have input-output linkages, both across their sectors within their own region, but also across other regions within Europe and with the rest of the world. There will be monopolistic competition um, with external economies of scale, so industry-level industry economies of scale. So rather than the example that Paul gave this morning from Millis, where you have increasing returns to scale at the firm level, the idea is that the more firms are in the, in the sector, this is going to lower the cost of production and therefore also prices. Another feature is we will have both private goods that were consumed by households and also public goods. That's kind of where we activate the public policy. Um, and there are going to be budgetary implications and spillover effects from local and EU governments that are going to choose those policies. They're going to raise taxes and provide subsidies to be able to fund those policies. Uh, and we're drawing on the large existing literature of uh, the classical gains from trade in this type of models uh, by Arkelakis, Cosimo, Rodriguez, Claire. Uh, and also more recently, uh, the work by Laskari Pugilogovsky that is looking at external economies of scale. So we're adding to that actually the GVC aspect and also the multi-layer governments based on that. That's the theory part. We're going to take this to the data and we're going to quantify the impact of those different policies on EU welfare and on regional uh, level outcomes. And we're going to source uh, from the sausage type of uh, uh, data sets. This is going to be meso data in a sense, where we all EU uh, regions, 235 nuts two regions. So the level of detail for Belgium, for instance, is 11 provinces, uh, plus the rest of the world aggregates. And all of those regions will have 55 sectors connected to each other within and across regions. Okay, if I run out of time or you fall asleep, this is already kind of the highlights of what we are finding up till now. In terms of aggregate welfare effects, Trade policy is bad, right? So this, uh, raising tariffs is, good, is not good for, for the EU as a whole. Industrial and, industrial and public policy might have uh, positive effects implemented. Of course, there's going to be a budgetary implication, right? If we're going to raise tariffs, we might raise tariff revenues. If we're going to subsidize uh, industrial production, this is going to cost money. So we're going to try to account for that also in the model. Um, when we're decomposing the welfare channels, we can take a look at the existing literature and we find that the classical gains from trade effects are rather small. So if I'm going to increase tariffs, resubstituting or reallocating uh, uh, consumption towards home, those welfare effects are quite small, in line with what Paul was saying in this type of models as well. Um, economies of scale are going to have a positive, small but positive impact uh, under each policy, and the idea that if you have large economies of scale, there will be more firms in the sector, it's going to lower the prices, and this lower price effect is going to generate positive welfare effects. However, what we find in the current calibration is that those input-output linkages really dominate all the other explanations. That's at the aggregate level. When we are going to look at the regional outcomes 
uh, for the EU regions uh, step by step, we find that there's going to be small aggregate effects. Uh, so the small aggregate effects we find uh, for the EU are actually obfuscating a massive variation across the regions. You will see that if trade flows, uh, if the welfare effects of, of trade policy are quite small, there are going to be regions which have uh, several orders of magnitude larger positive and negative effects. And these kind of wash out if you're going to look at the EU as a whole. Um, within countries, there might be regions which are top winners and also the regions which are top losers from the same policy. Um, so we're not going to talk about the political economy side of things here, but you can imagine that there might be some friction uh, if, you, if you know these, these outcomes. Um, and then if we're going to compare the same region across different policies, we can find that a, a region might be a winner in, under one policy and a loser on another policy. Okay, so um, I have... Uh, 20 minutes? Uh, oh, okay. Great. <laughs> so um, I'll spend some time on giving you just a very high level overview why I think it's interesting to look at regional heterogeneity and not just country level heterogeneity for the EU. Um, and I'll talk about the EU budget because that's something we're going to really exploit in writing down and calibrating and estimating uh, the model. I'll give you a very high level overview of the quantitative framework. Um, how things work. We're going to set things up. We don't have time to derive everything, but we are going to then go to explain how we can decompose the welfare effects of every channel, uh, welfare effects of every policy, and we can see where every policy kind of affects subcomponents uh, of those welfare effects. And then we're going to simulate uh, the model based on this uh, multi-regional input-output data uh, and see what happens in terms of welfare. Okay. So, We know there's country level heterogeneity in terms of uh, how rich or poor countries are. Um, if you do this at the regional level, there's still a high uh, spatial correlation. So regions in France are on average uh, richer than regions in, let's say, Bulgaria. But if you zoom into like the production and trade patterns, it's completely uh, uh, non-correlated spatially, at least. So uh, for instance, on the left-hand side, we're looking at the Krugman Specialization Index, which is a very simple measure to say, if this value is low, um, the production patterns of a particular region are very similar to the EU as a whole. If it's very high, you're very different. Uh, and this, in this case, probably means you're very specialized. Uh, and you see, if you do this at the regional level, that there's massive variation across regions within countries. And so there might be very specialized or very uh, homogeneous or, or EU uh, comparable regions next to each other within the same country. If you look at the trade pattern, so again, a very simple measure is import penetration ratio for manufacturing. So this is looking at how much of my stuff am I importing from extra EU divided by how much I am consuming uh, in total. You see that there's a massive heterogeneity as well. And so even within Belgium, for instance, you can see regions which are very exposed in general and regions which are not so much exposed. Um, in terms of the EU budget, so this is something that's... Uh, at the heart of, of, of the model in this sense. Um, so the way it works is you have a multi-annual financial framework, which runs roughly seven years, and it has a large uh, uh, budget in a sense. So for that seven years, it was around one trillion uh, euros to spend or allocate. Um, every year, the institutions agree on a yearly budget, which has to be balanced. So that's written by law, or it's written by the by the the treaties of the EU. Um, so for 2017, the year we're going to use as a calibration throughout, this was 140 billion euros. Do you have the side of the revenues, you have the side of the expenditures. In terms of revenues, by far the largest component is what they call the GNI, based on resource, which is every member state is going to contribute a share of its GNI, gross national income, to the EU budget. And this is roughly 1%. Uh, that everyone contributes. A uh, second important component is the traditional own resources, aka tariffs. That's mostly the tariff revenues that are in there. And then there's a small component that uh, some part of the VAT revenues are also uh, going back to the EU. On the expenditure side, the biggest component is now called, these nam names have been changing over time a little bit, but it's now called natural resources, aka the common agricultural plan. AKA industrial policy. 
Uh, smart and inclusive growth includes innovation and cohesion policy, so that's really thinking about how can we help uh, 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 remote regions in Europe uh, by subsidizing them. Okay. Good. The framework. Sorry, I have a little bit of math, uh, but uh, let me try to guide you through it. So there's a household side. Um, there are going to be representative households in every region J. They're going to consume both public goods G and private goods C. And so my total, as a household, my total consumption is going to be spread around stuff I buy from different sectors S, and I'm going to allocate a share of my budget, alpha S, to every sector. So think of the car industry in this case, right? So as in this case is the car industry, I'm going to spend, let's say, 5% of my total income on cars. I'm not just going to buy any type of cars. I'm going to source cars from different countries or different regions. I'm going to source them from France uh, and Germany, for instance. And if I'm going to buy cars from Germany, I'm also going to um, uh, uh, look at to buy potential Audis and uh, 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 BMWs. Okay. So there's a lot of variety for stuff that comes from multiple countries and a lot of variety that comes from a variety. There's going to be three sources of income. So uh, the households generate value added by uh, working. So that's the return on labor that they get. They get a return on capital. There will be taxes that they pay. So how much they pay in terms of local taxes, how much they contribute to the EU average or aggregate. And there will be uh, uh, um, uh, net foreign income in the sense that I might have assets abroad, people might have assets at home, and so these, uh, the net uh, stock of this is going to be uh, what I add to my uh, income. On the production side, um, it's going to be homogeneous firms within uh, sectors, uh, but there's going to be external economies of scale at the sector level. So uh, sector S variety uh, omega in region I is going to produce combining labor L with capital K, an intermediate bundle uh, Q. Uh, and the C is a productivity shifter. The higher the shifter, the better I am at producing outputs for the same amount of inputs. This allows us to pin down the prices. So if I am the price of a good that's produced in I and sold to J in sector S, it's going to be a function of its marginal cost C. It's going to charge a markup on that. So that's a theta S over theta minus 1. And there might be costs of shipping goods from I to J, which is kappa. And these costs include both the shipping costs, like what we call iceberg trade costs, so we need to move things around that cost stuff, but also includes the tariffs in there. Z is saying the more productive I am, the lower the price is going to be. And M is, is pinning down the number of firms that we have, or the mass of firms uh, in this sector. Right? And so the idea is that the more, this is external economies of scale, the more firms there are in the sector, uh, the lower this price is going to be. There are going to be local governments in every region I, which are going to raise taxes and provide subsidies, uh, such that those net taxes are going to be used to actually subsidize uh, uh, industrial production through this uh, TAO. I forgot to mention in the previous uh, case that so the TAO is actually where the policymakers are implementing uh, industrial policy. So lowering TAO is actually subsidizing local production, which is going to lower the marginal cost of production, lower the prices. Okay. They're also going to provide public goods, so the government is going to spend goods uh, 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 by consuming these goods. So think of, of building bridges and, and infrastructure. And to pay for these things, they need to raise taxes, uh, and they can run local budget deficits. There is a supranational government that gets income from the GNI resources we just uh, saw in the data. They also collect the tariff revenues, and they are the ones that are going to cover the local budget imbalances. Uh, and so, as has been written in stone, they have to run a yearly budget, a balanced budget. Uh, but this means that because there might be uh, net contributors or net recipients at a regional level, um, so, so for, sorry, um, regions might be contributing more or less to the, to the, to the EU than they get in return. Okay. Um, another thing, so the nice thing is that we can borrow from the existing literature and how to solve these models. Um, so we're interested in looking at what's the welfare effect of a particular policy. So the change in welfare, uh, W hat, in a given region, J, is going to be given by the increase in income, 
from three sources, as we saw, uh, a change in the price index, P, and a change in potential uh, uh, consumption of government goods. So we're going to solve the model in this nonlinear way, but for us to understand better what's happening under the hood, we're going to decompose it by log linearizing. Um, so that's a typical trick in the macro, but uh, we're just going to borrow from there. So a change in welfare can be decomposed in the income channel, the price index channel, and the public goods channel. And here you can start seeing what's the contribution of every individual component. So for instance, where do the policies enter, right? So if, I, if I'm interested in trade policy, I'm going to change my tariffs in this model. And these tariffs are going to show up within this lambda jj, which is actually the share of consumption that I'm spending on domestic goods. Industrial policy is going to be subsidizing stuff that's going to lower my marginal cost. This is going to show up in this blue component. And public policy, so consumption expenditures, is going to be inside the green y. So we know where different policies are going to show up already. We can also see how they relate to the existing literature in a sense. So um, in the classical uh, uh, gains from trades uh, literature uh, in this class of models, the red component is going to be the, the, the most important component or the only component in terms of prices that you see uh, affecting welfare. We also have this productivity effect in blue, and we have the external economies effect that we see uh, in green. The new component that we have is in terms of input-output linkages, and you see that they're showing up in different pieces of the uh, elements. So they're affecting the, the gains from trade, they're affecting the productivity channels, they're affecting the external economies of scale channels throughout. The red part is saying if a sector is a very important supplier to other downstream sector regions, this is going to be a high number and this is going to have a larger effect on, on, uh, on welfare. The blue component is the classical Leontief uh, uh, explanation. So government expenditures is going to drive up demand for, uh, for goods produced in those sectors. Those sectors need inputs from other sectors and this is going to scale up again. Okay. We're going to take the model to the data. Uh, as said, we're going to use the multi-regional input output data um, for which we're grateful we got access from the JRC at the European Commission. Uh, for 235 EU regions, 19 extra EU countries, so we can look at China if you want to, and one uh, conglomerate for the rest of the world. 55 sectors in every region with input-output linkages within and across the sector regions. Okay, so right now we just have a, a test drive of the model still, um, where we're going to say, we're going to shock uh, the model was saying 10% increase in trade costs for all manufacturing imports, which we can activate through this kappa. This is going to be raised by the EU government. Second exercise is industrial policy. We're going to increase subsidies by 10% in all manufacturing. Uh, so given the current situation for tariffs and, 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 and subsidies, we're going to shock them by 10% relative to, to the baseline value. Public policy, a 10% increase in final demand for manufacturing sectors. So trade policy being set at the, at the EU level, industrial public policy being set at the uh, local levels. What do we find in terms of aggregate effects? So the full is the, is, the, is the entire model that we're looking at. Trade policy is bad. The total effect of a 10% increase in tariffs across the board for manufacturing has a negative welfare effect of around minus 0.27. Uh, change in, 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 in welfare. Um, if we're going to shut down channels, we can look at what's the contribution of, of the classical gains from trade. That's by far the largest component. Um, if you allow for external economies of scale, this is going to add to go back to a slightly less negative value. If you compare with industrial and public policy, we have small but positive uh, effects going forward. We can also look at the welfare outcomes for every individual region and then see how dispersed those welfare outcomes are. And so you see that common policy, trade policy, at the EU level has by far the largest disproportionate effect or disparative effects across regions in the EU. And so if you start looking at uh, sector level or region level outcomes um, for trade policy, you see this massive heterogeneity. And so the underlying idea is that imports are going to drop, we're going to source more from EU suppliers away from the rest of the world, but at higher prices. So this is bad for welfare. Almost every region is going to lose. We color-coded stuff 
uh, center, north, east, and south regions. That's up for debate, but that's roughly the idea of, of seeing where those regions are. And you see by far the largest variation is in center, and south regions are on average less affected. Um, if we do this uh, sector by sector, we look at the top 10 sectors, so, so region by region, and then we say the top 10 regions uh, in terms of gains and top 10 regions in terms of losses, uh, we first find that there are winners and losers in every uh, country. And so, for instance, if you look at Germany, there are going to be top winners and top losers within the same country, right? So, so there's massive heterogeneity across regions within a given country. Shutting down channels, you see that in any case, it's really the input-output linkages that are going to dominate the welfare effects, either up or down. And it makes sense if you look at the, at the, at the decomposition that we showed in terms of welfare, because it kind of shows up everywhere as a multiplier. You can do the same kind of exercise for industrial policy. Um, here you see there's positive effects. Mostly uh, the largest gains are going to be for north and east. Uh, again, top 10 winners, top 10 losers. Uh, dominated by the input-output linkages in this calibration. Public policy, winners and losers, uh, the largest variance in, in welfare outcomes is going to be uh, for center. And so, as mentioned, the idea was to allow for the budgetary implications of all those policies uh, such that they are running deficits or not. Uh, okay, so if you're going to compare a given region and compare the outcomes in welfare uh, for every diff different policy, we find that there are uh, some policies which are very bad and some policies which, are, which might be good. So you might be winning in one uh, policy and losing in another. Uh, yeah. So I have less than one minute, so let me uh, conclude. We would like to understand what's the impact of a toolbox of protectionist policies on EU uh, and regional welfare outcomes. And while different policies might have the same idea of incentivizing domestic production, they generate very different aggregate welfare effects. And not only the aggregate, in terms of uh, cross-regional heterogeneity, there might be very large disparities across regions. And even for the same policy, you might have uh, winners, big winners and big losers within the same country. Um, and so the next step, so this was kind of trying to see how the model works, trying to understand what's happening. The next step is to understand which should we implement and can we think about optimal policy. As, as discussed earlier, this might be a trilemma. How many objectives do you have? How many instruments do you have? Can we combine different types of policies to generate uh, an optimal outcome? But we also need to know what's the social welfare function of the social planner in this case. But so, just to end with, a, with an open uh, question or remark, the EU is, is uh, relying on subsidiarity and proportionality as key guiding principles. Subsidiarity saying that we should take action at the lowest possible level uh, where it's possible, and proportionality, we only take the action that's required to achieve those outcomes. That's kind of at odds what we see in terms of like subsidy shopping that's happening right now. Big companies are shopping for investments to produce uh, electrical vehicle cars, uh, batteries. They're shopping in Sweden, Germany, uh, Spain, Italy, uh, and this is kind of uh, self-compete, self-destructive uh, in a sense. So maybe there is room uh, for uh, an EU level industrial policy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.